Let's take just a moment to relax, be still, become receptive in mind and heart. And I would like us to just remember that essentially we're not here to be entertained or to listen to some words. We're here to find that which will open some doors within ourselves. Self-discovery, self-revelation is what we're seeking. And so we turn to that great idea of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And we remember our oneness. We remember our wholeness. We remember that each of us is an identity within the infinite mind of God and each of us has his own free and open access to the flow of divine inspiration. And it is our goal and desire that during this time together tonight, we may awaken this inner flow and that we may go forth from here with a new insight that may lead to a new outlook a new perception of ourselves and of life and of persons and situations and thus in a very real sense we will experience life in a different dimension perhaps this is what Jesus meant when he said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and we're grateful for that Amen The Ten Commandments form the bulwark of the religion for hundreds of millions of people and have been a strong influence in the development of civil law in the Western world. But aside from this, as we've pointed out a number of times in the last few weeks, the Ten Commandments have become the great classic cliché. Every once in a while, someone smugly says, all we really need to solve the problems of our society is for people to live by the golden rule and the Ten Commandments. Well, I suppose if we could really understand the spiritual laws involved and live within them, that it would uh, be a tremendous blessing to society as a whole and to each person individually. Every once in a while in a group, situation when I hear someone say that we should live by the golden rule I usually ask if someone can put it into words for me and we get a lot of different variations sometimes I then say oh uh, you mean that the golden rule is do unto others as they do unto you and uh, almost invariably most of the people nod their head and say that's right the fact is that uh, that the golden rule in the human approach in life is uh, do others before they do you and you do it first. <laughs> but the, the point is that the, such ideas as the golden rule and the Ten Commandments um, are defenses. They really mean very little to the average person. Um, probably very few people could repeat or recite the Ten Commandments. I've never heard anyone that could. Can any one of you? Possibly you can. We've all, uh, most of us in our religious background, have, uh, have studied them, have learned them, maybe as a child memorized them. But they become kind of a symbol of what religion should be and the sort of a fence behind which we hide as a sort of a front that covers the fact that, after all, we are very religious people. Someone once said uh, sometime recently, I saw this in a letter to the editor in one of the newspapers, that uh, to prevent future Watergates, we need to have a greater emphasis on living by the Ten Commandments. Well, I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, I think the evidence seems to suggest that uh, the, quote, president's men were by and large religious people who probably knew more about the Ten Commandments than many of us. I don't know. 
But the tendency is, I think, to place the emphasis on keeping the commandments rather than doing anything about them. And we've kept them pretty well. We've kept them all wrapped up and, uh, and crystallized. So that our emphasis here is not to, to study the Ten Commandments or to memorize them or learn how to keep them, but rather to learn how to break them one by one, to break them, break them down, break them asunder, until we can come to understand something of the underlying principles so that they become not simply restraining walls or prohibitions of action, but, as we've suggested it, guidelines for an integrated life. And the higher meaning of the commandments suggests not a key to simply improving conduct or changing character, important as those goals may seem, but rather of altering or modifying states of consciousness. Unfortunately, religious institutions have too often become the means of absolution instead of transformation. In other words, the emphasis has been on image-making. And if a person has the good image and usually gets a big part of that good image by being seen going to church, then there's a sense of, of absolution of, of the problems of life, and there's very little emphasis on actually transforming consciousness, altering states of awareness. The great emphasis has always been on morality and the sin of immorality, but neglecting the truth of the spiritual nature of man, the suggestion that man needs ultimately to learn to live with what Thornton Wilder calls the incredible standard of excellence. Morality deals not with spiritual law, but with accepted rightness. And it is only a short step from the morality of accepted rightness to the rationalization that everyone's doing it. So when we consider such a thing as the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, we find all sorts of shades and variations, all the way from what we may call blatant theft and embezzlement to uh, the kind of gray areas which are really not all that bad because, after all, everybody is doing it. So what we're saying, the need is not to stress morality because that tends to be the accepted standard which changes, but rather the awareness of the spiritual nature of man, so that it's not so much a matter of what is being done, but what is the best the individual can do, not just trying to, to be a part of the crowd or, or to do what others do or even to be above what others do, but rather to be superior to our former selves and to be constantly seeking to progress in that kind of awareness. Now it would appear that the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, is one of the most needed commandments because essentially it deals with respect for property and the rights of ownership. It was an important commandment in Moses' time because these were nomadic people who had come out of slavery. and. Uh, it was very difficult, of course, with people who were moving around and living in tents to, to have any sense of ownership. You couldn't put fences around things. You couldn't say, this land is mine. So that uh, there had to be a certain kind of respect for the property rights of one another uh, to make this system work. I have uh, seen some figures that are somewhat dazzling, and even though they're probably not current, I can pretty well uh, believe that the current figures, if they were updated, would be even more startling. Figures that indicate that petty and major thievery, petty thievery all the way from, from uh, people who simply take a, uh, uh, a pencil eraser home from the office, because after all nobody pays for those things, to grand embezzlement and big thievery and uh, the kind of stealing that is at the end of a gun. But all kinds of, of stealing of every kind, including shoplifting and employee theft and so forth, amounts to over $30 billion a year, more than double the combined cost of education in the United States. Colleges, high schools, grade schools, preschools, buildings, teachers, administration, and everything else, more than double the cost of all this is somewhere in the area of, uh, of $30 billion, a figure that is probably a few years old, 
representing all the stealing that goes on in our society. Now, we're not going to lapse into a, into a moralistic tirade against stealing, nor are we going to say that we're for it. But, of course, the interesting thing is all of this sum, substance, loss of every kind, has to be paid for by someone, and, of course, as usual, you and I pay for it. So, in a sense, the, the effect of all of this stealing is what could be called the great ripoff, and we all pay. And then if you add the tremendous cost of insurance payments and security measures and locks on the doors and added police force and, first, and first, uh, beyond that, then, uh, then certainly uh, it becomes fantastic. And it doesn't stop there. You know, you, you would have to realistically add to this, though some of us may not want to, the stealing of time on the part of workers, stretching coffee breaks and uh, extended lunch hours and uh, calling in sick oftener than we need to, and padded expense accounts and uh, reduced effort or productiveness for one reason or another. All of this, in a sense, is a kind of stealing also, even though it's the kind that usually is accepted. But what do we do about it? We've tended to put our dependence in laws and criminal penalties, and for this reason we find that we kind of have to, to delineate and decide that there are certain types of stealing, some that are justified and some that are illegal and so forth. But we put most of the emphasis on law, and uh, we have discovered, at least it's about time we recognize, that, that the laws against stealing have done very little to cut down the problem, but actually add even more to the public burden. Now, actually, this law of no stealing in Moses' day was enforced in a very realistic and a very simple way. We're not suggesting that we turn back the clock, but at least we should take another look at what they did in those days. For instance, if a man stole an ox and he was discovered, he had to repay the original owner to the tune of five oxen. Usually meant he had to go to work for him for a good period of time until he repaid it. There were not many thieves in Israel. He didn't pay, because paying back five times for something taken was, was a pretty real deterrent. As a matter of fact, there were no jails in Israel. Therefore, there was no cost in administration in administrating this kind of problem. Now, again, not, not putting down the contemporary thing, but looking at it realistically, under our system, if a man steals someone's suit, the police probably, ultimately, we'll say, will arrest him, try him, find him guilty, put him in jail for six months, or more re realistically, because of crowded courts, he may sit in jail for six months awaiting trial before anything happens. The man who lost his suit by the act of the thief not only doesn't recover his suit, he might have to sacrifice many days of work in court as a witness. The thief possibly goes to jail where we support him for six months. Society loses the benefit of that man's work and all the time lost of the man who lost the suit and all the others who are involved in, in trying and sending him to jail, bearing the cost of the arrest and the imprisonment. And the victim loses the benefits of the suit and, and the costs that become phenomenal before we through. And in time, in the end, he tends often to decide simply that maybe it's best not to report the crime. And he also becomes cynical. And there is a growing sense of injustice within him, which tends to make him very vulnerable to the temptation <coughs> for the occasional ripoff. Now, under Mosaic law, the man caught stealing the suit of clothes would simply be required to go to work to restore, to restore four or five times the amount of the suit. And by the time he finished making the repayment, he probably would have learned that when you steal from someone, you not only make a rip in the fabric of society that must be repaired, but even more, you steal from yourself. And until we make some kind of implicit punishment which instills in the person the realization that stealing is self-stealing, there is very little that is done, and very few laws will be effective. And it's on this level only 
that we begin to deal with the problem. When the person understands in a very real sense and in a spiritual sense that no matter how he may be justified or motivated or what cynical attitudes may be subtly involved and what injustice he may have swelling up within his consciousness, the only true ripoff is a self-ripoff that the person actually steals from himself. But you see, it's ignorance of this great law that leads many, many persons on the endless round of trying to get something for nothing, hoping for the lucky break, finding the shortcut to getting ahead, to advancing in society. And it's this limited view of life that motivates both the thief and the gambler. And I suspect there are many gamblers, and maybe many of us as gamblers, who wouldn't like to associate ourselves in the same area. But let's take a look at it. The law, in its deepest sense, goes beyond the restraining walls of thou shalt not steal. Certainly we know, as we've discussed time and time again in the past few weeks, that uh, perhaps infants need playpens for their own self-protection. Young children may need fenced-in yards. Uh, teenagers perhaps require curfews as a training process. But the time must come when the child is readied for life and is set free. Ultimately, if he is not, his experience of life will be very limited. It is only through, as Tennyson would put it, self-reverence and self-knowledge and self-control that the person can actually feel self-reliance and be enabled to, to go safely into life. Now, the important teaching, you see, is not that you must not steal. We do not really, in the long run, help the child to understand life if we simply say, naughty, 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 you must not steal because I say you must not, because society says you must not, because the Bible says you must not. Because now he simply knows that he has to live behind a fence. And sometimes he discovers that fences are a lot of fun to climb or to dig under or to get around. And after all, if nobody's looking, what's the difference? So it's not enough to train a child that you shall not steal, you see, that you must not because uh, it's not the nice thing to do. Because this creates a tendency to repress feelings which otherwise may be normal, but which are normal only because he hasn't really come to understand himself. Therefore, he, he will possibly become a, a very good, religious, pious person who would never think of actually stealing, but may oftentimes think of stealing. And you recall that in our discussion last week of the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, that Jesus makes it very clear that if you have the thought of adultery in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So the thought of stealing, the attitude, the inner feeling, even if it is not expressed outwardly, is a breach of the fundamental of this particular commandment. The need then is to help the person, to help a child or to help any person along life's way to know the importance of integrity and to know what integrity is. Integrity indicating oneness, wholeness. To know that the individual lives within a spiritual universe and he is involved in a divine law that is just as true and as changeless and as inexorable as the law of gravity. And that no way, there's no way in which he can set aside this law for a few moments by saying, well, after all, nobody was looking and everybody is doing it. And after all they've done to me, I have a right to get back at them. The unfortunate part is, you see, we fail so often to understand that the underlying theme of this fundamental commandment is that not you must not steal, but you cannot steal. There is no way that you can steal. There's only a great self-delusion. There's a temporary feeling that you've gotten away with something or a feeling of guilt as a result of wondering if you're getting away with it. But no one ever circumvents the law. The person who robs another robs himself first. 
in a very subtle way, in a way that is not always outwardly manifest. He may not always be aware of this. But the point is, there's a breach in his own integrity or his own wholeness at the expense of his ultimate good. All important it is to know that you cannot get something for nothing. Any attempt to do so is an attempt at stealing. And you can't do it. You can't get something for nothing. There's always a price to pay. What will you have, quoth God, pay for it and take it, says Emerson. For instance, under the pressure of our current values in society, which I refer to often as the success syndrome, we have set certain goals before all persons and the goal is that you must get there. No matter how, you must get there. And if you don't get there, you are a failure. And most persons, because of the success syndrome, live under the stigma of the failure. Many people, even if they are relatively or, or moderately successful, at least have achieved certain creative things in their life, still think of themselves as a failure because they haven't gotten there wherever that there is supposed to mean, but it usually means a lot farther along than, than where I am. So often there's that frustrated urge to get there in any way. A student in school takes an examination. It's an important examination. Maybe it means whether he passes a course or not. Maybe it means whether he goes to college or not. Maybe it just means whether or not he, he keeps his allowance from his father or not, you see. But the exam is important, and everybody says it's important. It's important because you've got to get good grades. No matter whether you learn anything, you've got to get good grades. So he may be tempted to do a little cribbing, or to do a lot of cribbing, to get a hold of the notes or write answers on his cuff or all the many systems that are available, and students usually know them all. And therefore, as a result of cheating on the exam, he may pass the test and get the grade and keep his allowance and get the praise of his parent and of his teacher and get on an honor roll, maybe even go to college. But he's misunderstood something. The purpose of a test is not to limit him, but to enrich him. And by cheating, he denies himself the enrichment that the course was intended to bring. He steals from himself the good that should have been his, but never can be as long as he fails to keep the law of integrity. Something goes out of his life, and perhaps he even creates a pattern. And as he goes along through life, he knows the important thing is to get there. Anyway, hook or crook, you get there. And so it's only a short step from the justification that after all, you know, certain things are acceptable in our society, and everybody does it, and so forth, and the important thing is to achieve success. Emerson says, every man takes care that his neighbor shall not cheat him, but a day comes when he begin to care that he does not cheat his neighbor. In other words, the time comes when we begin to realize that there's a fundamental law involved. And in the question of, of how I can keep people from cheating me, it's a question of how I can keep myself in the consciousness of my relationship to the divine law so that I do not delude myself that I can take shortcuts that I can get by, that I can get something for nothing. Any time one deviates from the law, thou shalt not steal, he hurts himself. So a person who is sincerely interested in working with truth or with the metaphysical principle will become meticulously careful that he will never take anything or accept anything that is not rightfully his or fail to fulfill any obligation that is his. This is not moralistic, it's not being pious, it's not being holy, holy. It's a matter of realizing fundamental truth, and in the study of truth we might as well face up to it or forget the whole thing. For instance, and this is something I suppose that happens to everyone from time to time, you're paying your check in a restaurant or paying your bill in a, in a grocery store or whatever, and you suddenly realize that the cashier has given you too much change. 
Now you may suddenly say, well, it evens itself out because lots of times I've been gypped out of change, I'm sure, and they pay to charge you too much anyway, and the service around here is lousy, so it's what they get. But you see, when you really know the divine law and you know that you can't get something for nothing, and you know that there is a price to pay for everything, then the question is, why should I pay a price that I don't even know what it's going to be at what time? Just because in this point I can satisfy myself, well, I, got, I really got ahead of that time. I got, I got by with something. The decision is pretty easy for a good truth student. He calls the cashier's attention to it immediately, even though the cashier may snicker, may even not want to admit it because after all it's an ego thing. I never make a mistake, you know. People around you may say, what's the matter, are you crazy? But you know that you're dealing with fundamental spiritual law and it's not a case of who's getting ahead of whom, but the fact that you are working with law and you know that there's no way that you can get something for nothing. There's always a price to pay. It's not worth it otherwise. To, to subject yourself to the possibility of some ultimate repayment of this thing in some way in my life when, say, it's a matter of $1.29 right now. Unfortunately, people are often blinded to this cosmic law by smoldering feelings of injustice toward life. The tendency to feel that it's a kind of repayment. After all, look at all these crooks do, and look what the politicians get away with, and so forth. It's about time I had a chance to get mine back. This kind of thinking emphasizes or puts the emphasis on getting and having. And in time, it means that anything required to enable me to get and have, as long as it's not blatantly illegal, is tolerable. After all, the human consciousness says, who would ever know? Some of you may remember the story become somewhat of a classic, but it was true. It was a news story of a man out in San Francisco, California, who was walking down the street one time way early in the morning, and a Brinks truck came along the corner, and the rear door opened, and out fell a couple of sacks, and the Brinks truck went on. They had no idea that they'd lost it or even where it, where it had gone to, and the man opened it and discovered that it contained a half a million dollars in small denomination unmarked bills and the street was bare, and nobody would ever know. And without any hesitation, he called the FBI and turned it in. And they made a big news thing out of it, which was unfortunate, because it subjected the man to an awful lot of mistreatment. People were actually angry at him. He got threatening telephone calls and letters and everything else. How dare you? How dare you? When society provides such a marvelous opportunity to... To, to recoup some of the terrible losses and the injustices that are done, and you dare to give it back, you know, and, uh, and so forth. But people then asked him in a, in a kinder way, they'd say, but, but why did you do it? Nobody would ever know. Simple answer was, but I would know. I would know. Now, we don't know what his inner feelings were, whether he was motivated by an awareness of this fundamental divine law and the idea that you can't really steal, that you steal from yourself, or whether it was simply that he knew he had to live with himself and he wasn't going to give up that inner peace that he had, regardless. But the fact was, he took the only course of action that he knew. Now, it may be hard sometimes for a person to come to that decision, but I think that we need to take a good look at ourselves in terms of our sense of values and where we are going and where we are allowing ourselves to be pushed in society. I talked with a man some time ago about his son. The man was very upset about his son. His son had been caught cheating on an examination in school, and it was a, it was a very fine school, and he was uh, expelled from school. And the man was bitter. He was angry. He was ready to disown his son. Give him credit. He wanted to talk about it. He knew that something was wrong in his own consciousness. Well, we soon detected, both he and I, in a kind of a feedback time, that he was upset not actually because the son had cheated, but because he was stupid enough to get caught. And the man seemed to infer and eventually owned up to a subconscious feeling that was there, this sense that 
that if the young boy of his couldn't cheat successfully, how could he make it in life? Well, the man wasn't even aware that he had this kind of feeling, you see. But yet that sort of pressure that, that we put on persons and that sometimes is put on ourselves by this success syndrome, this feeling that we have to get there, becomes a very, very unfortunate thing indeed. The problem of compu confused priorities in our society is, uh, is, is a very serious matter. In other words, getting there is all important. We even tend to glamorize the thief and the sophisticated criminal, because after all, he got there. And so we make heroes of him often, because at least he achieved it. He, he got, you know, the Robin Hood. He made it, even if we didn't. Uh, no matter what he did, he made it. And after all, you know, maybe, uh, maybe he was robbing from the poor anyway all the while. So uh, we, we glamorize these people. But success is not getting there. Success is earning the right in consciousness to be there. And this is where we need to kind of reorient our thinking. So often we may feel that success is a matter of good fortune, of good luck, of lucky breaks, the result of knowing the right people, pulling the right strings, uh, perhaps having the right kind of image, and so forth. And as long as this becomes the tone of our thinking, then we may feel that the important thing is to work hard in these directions, put on the kind of image that, uh, that we feel is required, and we become suckers for all sorts of change-yourself-image courses so that I become a success image and I'm a likable sort of a fellow, even if I'm something else inside. And we become influenced to a point where we're not above altering or tampering with our resume and make it seem that we've known a lot more people than we have and we've done a lot more things than we really have. And there may be a feeling of, of maybe, maybe if this doesn't work, then maybe I should find some way to achieve good luck in my work and in my life. And, uh, and the moment we begin to think in terms of luck, then we think, well, after all, it's all a flip of a coin anyway, so uh, maybe if I win the lottery, it would get me there or if I play the right horse at the track, and our mind begins to go in all these directions. Why? Because essentially, we're trying to get something for nothing. Essentially, we've, we've thought about the goal of life as getting there, and the getting there, the position of there, is the position of, of uh, public acceptance, a position of affluence, it's a position of, uh, of success in every way. And somehow we've lost track of what it takes along the way to earn the right to be there. So it's just good luck anyway. The man knew the right, pulled the right strings, knew the right people. So there is a tendency, and I think this is where we come in as students of truth, there is a tendency sometimes to think of metaphysics and the science of treatment as a way to get something for nothing through metaphysics. In other words, to pull the right strings upstairs. Maybe if I pray and if I use the right affirmations, then God will pick me out of where I am and put me there. And after all, getting there is all that counts. Now, I realize that there's, there's an emphasis on this often in, in the metaphysical system. I don't buy it. I don't accept it at all. I think it's terribly misleading, but I know that this exists. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a certain amount of at least possibility for spiritual dishonesty and thievery in trying to get something for nothing through spiritual means. In other words, as we say so often, God can do no more for you than he can do through you. And therefore, to achieve certain ends, there must be some sort of a growth process through your own consciousness. The answer to your prayer for success should not come through the miracle of your employer suddenly looking up and say, hey, you know, a bolt hit him from out of the blue. Look at Jones over there. I always thought he was an income poop. He's really great. Come, Jones, I'm going to put you in the high position. Unconsciously, many folks think that this is the way the answer to a demonstration treatment should work when we're seeking for success. It shouldn't work that way at all. Because if that happens, poor Jones, when he gets in that high place, he's going to fall flat on his face anyway because he doesn't have the consciousness to stay there. 
The answer to the prayer for success or the prayer for prosperity should come through our whole nature in a total integration of self. So that first of all, we, the revelation comes not to the boss who suddenly promotes you without anything else happening, but the revelation comes to you in terms of a good, honest look at yourself concerning where you are, what you're doing, what your interests are, whether or not you are giving all that you can, fulfilling your own creative process, or whether you're caught up in fear and envy and and uh, all sorts of self-limitations which are keeping you bottled up within yourself. So the answer comes in the expression and expansion of your own consciousness, of your own abilities, so that you begin to, to demonstrate in a very real and natural way growth and progress out here because you've earned it, because it comes through you instead of simply to you. Now, obviously, this is what some like to feel is the long way around, and many folks are impatient. How impatient are you? Thou shalt not steal deals strictly with impatience. It's strictly the person who wants to get there, and he's in a hurry to make it. And so he goes out and finds whatever recourse he can. This is, this is what stealing is all about, whether it's stealing in a spiritual sense or whether it's literal taking a gun and going out and holding somebody up. It's impatience. It's a matter of wanting to get there, feeling the pressures. Pressures, certainly, sometimes of hunger, the pressure of, of conformity with society that says you've got to get ahead in order to be accepted and so forth. One of the things that I think we need to look at very strongly is this, this matter of chance and luck and good fortune. To give up the idea entirely, the idea of luck in life or favoritism in the universe. People carry this, this uh, attitude in, in so many ways, thinking that it's just sort of a flip of a coin. Quite often a person will pray for something and then he will talk about it afterwards and say, well, I prayed about that and I got real lucky. I had my prayer answered. So that, in other words, God was just a, another roulette wheel upstairs somewhere and he hit the jackpot. The important thing then is to try to get the realization of divine law, to know that consciousness as an influence is inviolable. There's no way you can bypass it. To be healthy, you must have a health consciousness. To be prosperous, you must have a prosperous consciousness. To make it, you must have what it takes, which is but another way of saying in human parlance that consciousness attracts. You must have what it takes. In a very real sense, we should study the magnet. A piece of magnetic steel draws iron filings to it because that's simply what magnetism does. And no matter what happens outwardly, you can shake the magnet, you can lift it up and shake it around and jostle it, but the iron filings stay right there. They cling to it. They're drawn naturally to it, and it's very difficult to get them off. Now, you can take a piece of unmagnetized steel, and you could say, well, after all, the important thing is to have iron filings. And so you go out and find some iron filings, get them somewhere, anywhere, and sprinkle them all over the top of your little piece of unmagnetized steel. And so you look pretty good. You've made it now. You have the iron filings. But how long do you have them? Because unfortunately, life is not a static experience. It's a growth process, and things happen. There's a flow. There's a movement. And the first little jostling, all the iron filings go flying because there's no means by which they can be attracted and held. This is what magnetism is. So the important thing is that that this is not favoritism, it's not good or bad luck, it's fundamental natural law. And this is why Jesus would say, to him that hath shall be given, from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath, even though it seems to be divine injustice. We say, well, it's bad enough in society, but to think that God treats us that way, well, that's even worse, you see. But this is divine law, and it works through consciousness. And though we may be impatient, and we may want to short-circuit the process, we may be in a hurry to get things done otherwise, we break the fundamental law, thou shalt not steal, or break ourselves upon it, because nobody really can steal, because there's always a price to pay. Trying to get something for nothing is simply like trying to, to get iron filings out of life without magnetism. To achieve the good that we humanly desire, we so often take shortcuts. And... Uh, the important thing is we want to realize that demonstration is a matter of creating the conditions 
that make the results inevitable, creating the conditions in consciousness, creating the patterns of mind, creating the right attitudes, creating the right feelings, creating the level of awareness that make the result inevitable. The law of being is that whatever comes to us, whatever happens in our lives, whatever surrounds us, whatever kind of environment we're involved in, will be the manifestation of consciousness. We may not like it, we may resist it, we may resent it. We may talk all about the injustices of society and so forth, but this is the way the law works. Whatever it is that is in your consciousness or mind must manifest, no matter who tries to stop it. Nobody can keep it from you. Nobody can force you to have it. It will manifest. And whatever is not in your consciousness, whatever condition is not present in the fabric of your inner self, there's no way that you can make it happen in a way that's real and satisfying and lasting. Of course, the answer is you can change your consciousness. And that's what this new insight and truth is all about. Basically, as I say, the thief or the gambler or the average person who does even the little gray area things to try to get ahead in life, assuming that it's all right because everybody does it, are all motivated by the same impatient feeling. They all want to get there. They all want to have it. And they want to have it now. And find that uh, perhaps if we can just take the little shortcut, maybe that's the easy way to get there. But there is no way, no way to circumvent the law. Breaking the legal law is only a small part of the problem. And sometimes, of course, we see someone break the law and we say, well, that's, it's not fair. He does it, she does it, they do it, they get away with it. Why can't I? But that's to totally misunderstand the way law works and where one's conscious attention should be. You can never know what is happening in another person's lives. You never really know what price he's paying. You never even know what his motivation is. You don't even know the level of his consciousness. You have no awareness of the other. So this is why Jesus says, judge not according to appearance. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. You remember the story probably of uh, the three ministers who uh, went fishing and uh, they fished for a good while and finally one was a Jewish rabbi. He said, well, fellows, he said, I've had enough. So he folded up his rod and his fishing tackle and put it all away and stepped over the side of the boat and walked on the water to shore. And the other two fishermen looked at one another and they were a little puzzled about this. And so finally the Catholic priest, who was the second one, he said, well, Joe, he said, I think I've had enough too. So he put his fishing tackle away, took hold of his box and stepped over the side of the water and walked on the water to shore. And uh, the other one, who was a Protestant minister, he was really incensed by this. Well, if they can do it, certainly I can. So he put his tackle away and stepped over the side of the boat and went right down to the bottom. So he came up and was draped over the side of the boat, coughing and sputtering, and finally got over the side of the boat and thought and prayed a little while, and then got out of the boat again and walked and went right down to the bottom again. This went on for about a half an hour, and he was a little short of drowning. When finally the other two clergymen on the shore, looking at him and laughing, and one of them said to the other, Maybe we better tell him where the rocks are. <laughs> so when you see someone taking the shortcut and uh, seemingly getting by with things, it may well be that you don't really understand. He may be standing on some rocks that you're not even aware of. It is inadvisable to judge one's life by the performance of the life of another or what is generally done in society. You have to live with yourself. You have to deal with law relative to your consciousness. And the important fundamental that we should never get away from is that there is no way, no way ever, that you can get something for nothing. And it's the motivation, the feeling, the desire to get something for nothing that causes all kinds of stealing, petty and major. And for this reason, I think it's important that we take a real hard look at this matter and know that we're dealing with a commandment that is not simply moralistic. Certainly, we have to find some way to correct the tremendous emphasis on stealing in our society, big and little. But we want to deal with it in ourself in relationship to certain tendencies, certain states of mind which are impatient and that try to circumvent the process and get something for nothing. Some people say, oh, you're just, you're just down on gambling and so forth. You're just a regular old preacher. 
And in our society, certainly there's a great deal of emphasis that is placed on gambling and a great deal of encouragement for it. And I must confess, I'm very saddened by it. I'm saddened because I think it, it uh, becomes a distortion of reality. And oftentimes when, when the, the politicians or the political system comes to the conclusion that maybe the way we can pay our educational bills is to encourage people to gamble and play the lottery, that this is stealing from society because it comes right out of the pockets of people who can usually ill afford it to pay the bills for the educational system and uh, money that probably should be spent this way goes some other way that is probably far less beneficial to the whole. But again, this is simply one aspect of it and I confess that I do have that kind of a hang-up. And I feel that a person is terribly deluded every time, no matter what he does. I mean, if it's true that if a person gambles just for the fun of it and he pays his dues and says, well, I take $20 out to the track and I play the ponies and I have fun and go home and win, lose, or draw, I've had an afternoon's entertainment. Nothing against this. It's fine. So that I have no feeling of moralism about gambling, but I feel that the person who who goes to the track or goes to the lottery window or whatever it is and the numbers and so forth and has a feeling that maybe this is the way I can demonstrate my good as a person who is a victim of a great deal of self-delusion. And he's a victim of the same basic motivation that drives the thief to steal. He's trying to get something for nothing. And it doesn't work. There's a price to pay some way, some time. And as I say, I'd rather have a determination in what price I pay for things rather than defer it to some time that I may not even be aware of. I may, I may win the lottery and come in with $50,000 and then have to pay some sort of a price according to this, this fundamental divine law that I might not be ready to pay at some time and have no alternative. In other words, it's a matter of, of being sort of overdrawn spiritually in the bank of the universe. So I think it's, it's vitally important then to, to try to to get the awareness that we're involved in a fundamental divine law where all things work in an orderly way, consciousness draws to me that which I need, and instead of trying to get by any means, if there is a desperate need, no matter what it is, or where, or when, the most important thing would be to turn toward giving. When things get tight, something's got to give. Because the law is give and you shall receive. And if we emphasize the get without the give, then we're trying to short-circuit the law, and we're stealing in a very real sense, though we may have rationalized it in other ways. So we want to get our heart and root into this commandment so that we can kind of understand that it involves all of us. We may piously say, well, I don't steal, so that, doesn't, that lets me out. There's not a one of us that goes very long through a day without some sort of subtle stealing in this sense, in terms of the full sense of the law, where we're seeking to circumvent the law and get something for nothing. There's always a price to pay. All important is the law of consciousness, working to build personal integrity. Don't try to get something for nothing. Don't let yourself even dwell in the thought that maybe sometime you'll get something for nothing, either through work, even through prayer, or through any means. Don't put the emphasis on the iron filings, but on building the power of the magnet. All right, let's, uh, let's take a moment now to be still. And I want us all to just take a minute to emphasize this tremendous realization within ourselves. This awareness of divine law which is self-regulating and self-fulfilling. And the insight that as we work with law, then the results are sure and secure. We would seek to route out of our consciousness any tendency, any feeling, any motivation that seeks to circumvent this law or to get something for nothing. And we remind ourselves that there's always a price to pay. And we want the price within our means. We want it within the area of our interests. And so we make the commitment tonight, the commitment to work with this divine law. Not in a purely surface way by saying, well, I don't steal, so I guess that's all there is to it. But to make the commitment 
to rooting out of our consciousness the tendency to be in a hurry to get there and to have what we assume comes when one is there, to overcome this kind of impatience, to know that all things must come through consciousness, that God can do no more for us than he can do through us. And we give thanks for this awareness. And in this commitment, we know that we're going to live within a fundamental spiritual law in which things shall work for good, consciousness shall draw to us easily and effortlessly that which is in keeping with the general area of our interests and our feelings and our present level of unfoldment. And when we're ready for more, we will find the motivation to dig deeper within ourselves, to build the awareness and to draw that more in normal, natural, easy, right and wise ways. And we make this commitment to law, we know that it is not in any way coercive, it's supportive. Basically, it's a law of consciousness and a law that leads to prosperity and health and well-being. And as Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, the awareness of our divine flow and all these things shall be added in easy, right, wise, and orderly ways. And we give thanks for that. All right, now as we go forth tonight, let's just for a moment return again to the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There is but one, one God, one presence, one power, and let's relate to it in the consciousness of our own oneness. Each of us is one in the one, one with the one, one in the continuing influence of this one in our lives, surrounded and enfolded by a protecting presence, a prospering influence, a guiding, directing intelligence. And in the consciousness of this one, all things shall come to us in right and orderly and wise ways. We shall walk in a sheltered and protected way, we shall find things working together for good, and our lives shall be filled with peace and fulfillment, all because we are in the one, and we know the one, and we build on the consciousness of the one. And we rejoice and give thanks for this, and we bless you, each and every one, as you go in this consciousness. Amen.